So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's talk, photography. And I know that in the wings, I have Jack Wing, Jack Eames, Wings, Jack Wings. Just gave you a new name there, Jack. Sat there <laughs> waiting to get involved with me, Jack. And really, it's been really nice getting to know you over the last couple of weeks, just chatting in preparation to this. And I am, um, you know, excited uh, to, for you to give them an insight into you and your and your world. But before we look at any images and talk about, you know, hair and beauty and commercial photography. Tell us a little bit about you, mate, and sort of how you got to where you are. Hi, Jay. Well, yeah, Jack Wings. That's that's a Jack good one. Wings. <laughs> <laughs> Jackwings.com. Um, very good. Yeah, no, um, thank you for having me on today, first of all. And you and Laura have been brilliant. So, um, thank yeah, you. we've been chatting, like I said, for a few weeks now. You made me feel very welcome. Um, I'm a beauty photographer. So I shoot mostly hair, some skin, a little bit of makeup and some fashion um, and sometimes lingerie, but basically along the beauty lines and based in London, that's where our studio is. And some of these pictures that you'll see throughout the presentation are at the studio or were even indeed just shot at the studio, which is White Rabbit, um, centre of Shoreditch, which is a great space for just being around creative inspiration, be it the streets, um, the ca coffee shops, um, constant um, new graffiti on the walls. It's just a great space to, to create and bring clients to, really. Um, we have an office upstairs where the clients come. And so, yeah, does that give you a bit of an insight into it who does. I am, Jay? So with, with, the, with regards to the photography, where, where did that kind of passion start and, and how did you, how, was it a decision to go straight after the hair and the beauty uh, and uh, that side of things? Or did you, did you travel to that eventually? How did, how did that go for you, Jack? Uh, really good question. And I think that's one of the things that's um, hopefully going to be good about the, you know, the people that have joined us today. I, you know, we all come at this from different backgrounds and different certainly photographic backgrounds so I started off in corporate portraiture um, but even before that I started off um, doing photojournalism at uni uh, then was in um, a high street portrait studio for about a year or two so I learned how to sell there which I think is an important part of this chat today um, you know because we I think we're in a fortunate place where we do what we love and we love what we do, but we also have to make money out of it. Um, so I think that was a good training for me in the high, sort of high street, you know, baby, kids portraiture, you know, um, sometimes couples as well and things. So I learned about dealing with people then, uh, which was fantastic. And then... Yeah, I, I lived in Sheffield. I had two studios in Sheffield, again, doing sort of commercial portraiture, but was starting to shoot more model uh, portfolios. Uh, and then a few brands got in touch and then I was desperate to make it happen in Sheffield. But it's just this weird pull where London just seems to be the hub and I couldn't change that. So I went down to London, reshot my book, slept on friends' floors did lots of door knocking and eventually a few people sort of started to say yes. And um, yeah, that sort of you know, brought me up to where I am today. But it's, you know, so much of that was the network that I built up at the start and the people that I began to um, meet on set or at, um, I, I guess, industry events as well. Um, I was never one for sort of going to London and going in the bars and things like a lot of people said, I just, just didn't want to be my approach. Um, I just wanted to get into it through shooting my own ideas. So I just found a good hairstylist, good makeup artist, and a, um, a warehouse in Hackney that charged me about 70 quid for a day. Um, so just built my book up through that, really. Brilliant. Well, we're, we're going to touch on the sort of commercial process and the building on that in, in the chat today. But I think it's important and as we've discussed, you know, sort of the way we're going to structure this, we're going to look at the, the, the photography to start with. Um, and I know that you gave me some key images that you're going to talk us through and your thought process and what, what they were used for and how they've got uh, and, and built this business for you today. So I think if we start with that, but um, and then as we've discussed, we can look at the, the nature of the business together um, and, and, and they can ask any questions they want. So 
Um, we're going to get, as I said, I'm going to start looking at Jack's photography with him now. I'm going to start talking about that, guys. But any of your questions, put them through the question panel about what we're talking about. Or as you know, we're going to talk about the commercial industry and the fashion and hair industry as well. So um, no question is, uh, is, is, is a stupid question. So pop them in there and we'll put them in the appropriate um, sections as we move through. Um, or we'll always allow plenty of time mm -hmm. to make sure all of your questions are answered. Uh, before we finish. So Jack, let's get into the photos. So you know that I've got them for you anyway. So um, obviously we're going to tell their stories, but you feel free to prompt me to move on when you're ready to move the images forward. Cool. So uh, you should be seeing what they're seeing now, mate, uh, on the screen there. Great. And I chose this one to start um, the presentation. And there's six images there, everybody. So don't feel it's going to be some 24-hour uh, holiday. Um, <laughs> Snap show. Um, yeah, th this we I shot this a few years ago. This is part of a personal shoot, and why it's so important to me is that it still appears in potential clients or clients' mood boards when they're putting certain looks together. And there was an, a hairstylist at the time that I did a commercial job with, um, and we got on really well. And we said, let's do some uh, a test shoot together. So I had to pay for the studio, the lighting, the retouch. There's very minimal retouch on this, which I want to sort of talk about as well as we go. But it's just a, for me, it's a very iconic image um, that has stood the test of time, um, the form, the shape, what, you know, what is revealed and what isn't revealed is really important. It's not your traditionalized camera, because I think as we go through the pictures, so much of what we do as photographers is about an emotional connection and i think when there's not eyes to camera you, you you've instantly lost one of the biggest um tricks abilities to get the uh, level of emotion across but i still get people saying you know the, they'd have this on their wall it makes them feel in various ways but yeah, this this is something that then Hunger Magazine took and run, and Hunger Magazine is set up by Rankin. It's his magazine, so it's a great one to be featured in. We got quite a lot of work on the back of that. So the key message here, I think, for myself and any anyone else really who's sort of looking to do this kind of work is that personal work is kind of everything really, because you can then market these pictures to various um, potential clients, magazines on Instagram, and I still get lots of work just from this picture alone. We, um, yesterday, just to share a quick story with you, yesterday when uh, you sent me through the order of the images as we were chatting, um, I had the email open, you know, with the that you sent me with the order of the images, and Brandon, my videographer, um, just came in to bring something through to me, and that's what he saw on the screen. And straight off the bat, he went, that's awesome. He said, Mark didn't shoot oh, that. Man. And I said, no, Mark didn't shoot that. He said, he's with us tomorrow. Um, I, I've got a question for you. So the, 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 obviously it's striking and the hair is incredible. So is this something that the hairstylist brought to the table or did you have that idea for the shape of the hair yourself, Jack? Where, where does it work in the collaboration? Yeah, really good point. Uh, we, Kim Roy and myself, talked on this for weeks, if not several months. We met up and we um, we literally sent emails back and forth. We cut things out. I wanted to do something particularly sculptural, but not, um, you know, just something that was still, still slightly classic, slightly futuristic, but not to um, certainly not avant-garde. So we spoke a lot about the form and the shape and she got it, but between us on the day, she, she started somewhere and then we worked more towards it. And out of that shoot, we came out with about, gosh, about nine or 10 different hairstyles that day. It was a bonkers day and it was fantastic. So yeah, it's a lot of talk and a lot of collaboration really. So also so that there's no surprises on the day. We both know what we want from it. And uh, so nine or 10 different styles with, with one model? I think we had three models that day. Okay. Um, and I have a good working relationship with most of the model agencies. So we just say, look, this is a mood board of what we wanted to pull together. Who have you got in yep. town on Thursday or whenever it is? So yeah, about three different models. Brilliant. 
brilliant. Um, okay, so look, we'll ask this while while we're while we've got it, and um, because they're coming in, let's have a look. Uh, well, I'll do the, we'll do the re retouch question in a, in a bit, but there's a question there. Um, is that uh, what? So okay, let me. Sorry, I'm just reading out corn my Let's read it properly. Um, Typically, um, how many lights are you using when you're shooting, Jack? And what type of backgrounds do you look for? Is that just a paper background or a white wall? Or? That's the cove. Okay. Um, I personally move around a lot on a shoot, be it on a small wheelie chair or literally. Um, I mean, I'm six foot six, so it can be a real pain in the ass to <laughs> crouch down and move quickly. So the, the beauty of shooting against a cove as opposed to a colorama is twofold, really. I get the, the bill, it enables me to very much find the angle and the composition because, yeah, the model can move and we can all stand there and go click, click. But I think it's a two way thing. And that's when you get the chemistry and the real charge for me in photography is when I'm moving and I'm working damn hard as well to find the angle because everything is about the angle and the composition so i'm slightly lower here so the cove enables that but equally however good or whatever color the color armor is even if you're shooting black and white there's always a texture with color armor and personally i don't like that um and if if we whatever color background we're shooting i'll always try and see if myself or the client can pay for it to be painted um whether that's the section of the cove or we get two flats side by side and we put masking tape down the middle and we we paint them because then you've got the depth the, the the depth in this picture works with the skin tones and the background and there's movement on the background deliberately so in terms of lighting i'm a strong believer in that you know at the end of the day there's there's only one sun um and i think that's so important when when we light and so I think this is lit with, I think it was a breeze 77, you know, coming up from slightly above and to the right. But there is some fill on this through, a, we shoot a lot through a frame and by a frame, I mean something that's about eight foot by eight foot or 12 foot by 12 foot um, with a diffuser on there. And we either shoot two heads through the diffuser or bounce two heads in there just so it gets a little bit daylighty and you know we try and never really point a flash at the model um because it can yeah you know it, it's flash flash can be quite unflattering and basically you know especially in beauty we're always looking at the texture of the light does, does that answer your question yeah it does brilliant mate thank you uh, and we're, we've got some stuff we could, we're going to see that great uh, studio shot later on in the in the talk anyway, and um, uh, and we, we'll be able to explain the cove a bit clearer then if for people who aren't maybe not familiar with the coves, that's brilliant, mate. Right, so like, shall I give us the next one? Certainly. Okay, here we go, mate. Okay, um, do you want me to jump in there? Yeah, you go for it, Ben. Yeah. And also what I just wanted to say is, like you said earlier, Jay, there is 100% never a stupid question. And if anybody wants to ask a question and the same question, I'm completely cool with it. I'd rather there are questions and this is um, about a two way thing. You know, you ask, we chat about it because everything, including once you walk into the studio, it's about people and relationships and you've got to work in very small amount of minutes. So it really is being together. So just please just ask me anything. So back on this picture, this is an interesting picture for me because it's the polar opposite to the one that we started with. And this is what I think is really interesting with um, and relevant with photography now in terms of the current feeling of, of looseness. Uh, by looseness, I mean, there's a spontaneity, um, the, the hair is much more undone. This is lit with ambient light. Now I go to Arles, which is in the south of France every two years, which is where uh, Les Ray Contraire is it's the bringing together of photographers from all around the world. And I'm sure some of your you know, 
members and uh, listeners today have probably been out there. It's, it's one of the most amazing experiences you could ever do in your life. You're just surrounded by um, galleries, free galleries, beautifully curated, some of the most amazing portrait and fashion photographers and all kinds of photographers, but it's beautiful. It's current and there's retrospectives. So I got this model to fly down to Arles and we just walked around Arles for two hours. And so this is, I did the hair, she did a bit of makeup. This is just shot on a, I think like a Canon EOS. Um, and it was in a, a public municipal shower. Um, you know, the, the, the sun was so bright outside, I needed somewhere that was a bit, a bit more sort of diffused. So we just walked in there. I didn't speak any English, but we took the pictures. And this picture, again, clients still pick up on this picture because it's got life. It's um, th There's just a softness there, but it seems just feels very current. And I actually shot that quite a few years ago, Jay, but it's still on our website and agents, art buyers, they just like the energy of it. So, so interesting on that. So when um, was there a, this was was this a job and was there a brief? No, sorry if I didn't make it clear. It's literally, uh, I was there for three or four days looking at um, galleries and I just got this model to come to um, Arles because I wanted to do some personal work in the street. So it's personal work. There was no team, no client, just me and her. Um, you know, we had a ball, we, you know, we had coffee, we chatted, we did pictures every so often. And, you know, again, I probably came out with 10 or 15 pictures and so it's just pure personal work but again with the view to thinking right how can i use this yeah. later on yeah so um purely purely natural light here jack or do you take anything extra with you you know reflectors or any speed light or is it just natural light nothing it's pure ambient light um but again, I just think the you know moving away from using flash sometimes the ambient and that's one of my other pictures as well. Ambient just has a different texture to it, and I think emotionally we we connect more with it. And and you know there was a light coming in from the windows um, and a bit bouncing off the floor because you know we're in the south of France and the light out there is. Oh, I'd move there tomorrow. You know, it's great. Brilliant, brilliant, mate. Right, so I think. The next one's back in the studio, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it is. Yep, yeah, this is back in the studio. This is for one of my main clients. Um, it's a brand called Tony and Guy, which is, um, they've got salons all over the world. So this is for their global campaign. Um, and it just shows off the artistry of the hairstylist. There's probably two or three people doing the hair on this and we did you know the usual shots from the front and she walked off and i was just like flipping it get back on set um i need to shoot you from the back uh it's just so beautifully beautifully sculptured and this is one of the ones they actually used for their campaign and every single element jay is sort of thought thought out beforehand about you know what the fashion is going to be the colors um you know the, the angles of the hair but just to be very clear on that we we, we start with a map and mood boards and the mood boards are printed and put on the walls but i like to run the studio that we're very very fluid and we can move away from that hence why she walked off set and i saw that and i thought my god that has to be shot so everybody feels comfortable during my shoots to suggest ideas try ideas jack i've just seen this angle next door in the makeup room can i just bring her on set absolutely do you know what more more times than not they're the pictures that get used it's just you know thinking very quickly and in the moment it was uh we were chatting beforehand and um i was somebody that you've heard of but somebody who's done stuff for us uh, andy kruchek on the site obviously another hair and, and beauty photographer so i'd spent some sure. time i spent some time on on uh two of his uh, you know commercial hair shoots i think it was for uh uh hairdressing competitions you know they're, they're, they're huge aren't they i think and he was um yeah. he was he was working with two particular salons on these two different days but and i know we can would be able to share share it in, in some of your images later on when we're talking about um the team and the uh, and the and the shooting and everything and, and we've got some great behind the scenes to be able to get that across to the people but for that was the first time that i'd experienced there have been a many photo shoots with many photographers but it's the first time that i had personally experienced anything fashion or hair or beauty um and it it, it it was fascinating but it was it 
it wasn't fast not fast but the the it was intense you know as you said seeing mm. the mood boards having the client the stylist the makeup artist of course you the photographer and the photographer's assistants and up until then i was kind of just used to me taking a picture by myself or occasionally and and i've never worked with an assistant but obviously being around mark and filming him for so many years you know, we might have one assistant max, but it was, but it was, it was absolutely, you know what? And, and, and Mark was with me that day and Mark could tell you himself that, you know, he, he's, he's a wannabe, you know, failed fashion photographer. You know, he was a young father and just went down the, the portrait and, and money route, but wanted to be the fashion photographer, you know, and he just, and, he, yeah. and I could see it and it's like, yeah, Jay, this is what I always wanted. And, you know, he's done a little bit of it, but you know, life is different for all of us, but uh, no real insight. And I was thrilled when you sent me those behind the scenes because I, I hoped we were going to be able to get that across to the audience, which we are later anyway, so that's brilliant. But uh, no, I'm, I'm loving that. But I also saw exactly what you just said, is that, you know, you go in with one concept in mind, um, but then you saw the, the reverse, which, yes, is amazing. Um, and I, <laughs> I always quote our landscape. We've got a landscape master, Jack, on the site. And he always says, you know, with this landscape photography, the best bit of advice he's ever given is look around you. You know, you might go with one shot in mind, but, you know, as you've said, look at every angle, look at every opportunity. You might actually come away with a shot that you weren't planning that was the shot that, you know, you always wanted. So, um, so I, I love that. Love that. Right. What we've got next, mate? So the very first shot, the opening shot where I'm in the studio, um, we have the upstairs of this space. So this is part of my office. Now this girl's called Alice um, and she just dropped in to do what's called a go-see. Now a go-see is when, um, I don't want to pe teach people to suck eggs, you know, probably most people know what a go-see is. So a go-see is when a, someone who's got an interesting face comes into my office or studio and we do a couple of pictures together just to see how she shoots before uh, you know she might be starting out or i might be looking for a particular look for a certain shoot so she dropped by um and she was amazing i generally try and have someone shot very quickly but you know she agreed to stay for about 15 20 minutes we did a load of pictures a little bit of film as well and she was absolutely incredible. And this is again shot with pure natural light coming in from um, my window. It was about half past 10 in the morning. It was quite a low light, as you can see by the shadows, but also the windows are quite dirty. So in places, uh, it softens down a bit, as you can see towards the back of her right shoulder and things, but then it's very sharp underneath her neck. So why I wanted this in there was because of the reason I explained is sometimes it's great to be really ad hoc and gorilla and just do a 15, 20 minute kind of go see with the natural light that's around you against a wall, against a window. Um, I didn't know how this was gonna come out really. I just shot right against um, the light and we did loads of pictures. She was great and from this, she got to do the next Tony and Guy campaign. So it was great. She earned some money. I put forward a model to Tony and Guy that they loved and they completely restyled her and she's flying now. She's doing great. So it's just quite an exciting story. And I think for me as a photographer, again, there was no team there. There was no makeup, no hair, no assistants, no client. Um, it's just really exciting to work like this. Absolutely. Interesting that go see. So I don't think it was a, a suck egg thing at all because we we here we just refer to them as test shoots or you know trying to model out. So I've never not really I've, I know the term but not used it. But go, staying on that as a question then, Jack. So when you did you, was it somebody that she came across your path and you thought right let's shoot her or did she approach you? Where did where did you sort of initially see her or find her? So. It Good question, because it's a really good example of what generally happens. I, her friend, Charlotte Rose, um, and I'm just saying some names because people might want to just go on Instagram and sure. um, have a look at these people's Instagram sites, because that's another area we should talk about, you know, in, in this, Jay, is that how the importance of Instagram. Um, so I, how did I come across Charlotte? Um, I think I spotted Charlotte in someone else's pictures. So I contacted her and and she wanted to do a shoot and it was great. And then Charlotte said, oh, 
I see you shoot a lot of hair. My friend Alice is is great in looking at getting into photography. Would you shoot her? So I contacted Alice and I knew from Alice's Instagram that she was she had a lot of potential. She was fab. So I just just called Alice in and she came in straight away. So that's how so based my point being is you just once you start opening up comms and opening up and doing little shoots. You just don't know what's going to come from it. It's that old yeah. cheap, you cliche, you know, from an acorn comes a tree, you know, because she then got the nice um, commission to do the Tony and Guy gig. It was, um, uh, and I will share it because it's so relevant, but it's perfect what you're saying. So we have, we have a, uh, well, now a friend, another friend of mine, another photographer like you will be because we get to know these guys through these webinars. Um, but I got contacted, or Mark and I got contacted by um, uh, a photographer from, no, I'm going to be really bad. I think it's Finland, but his name's Antti Karpanen. And he happened to be in Cardiff um, because his wife was teaching here for two years uh, in university. Mm -hmm. And he was like Finnish portrait photographer of the year, a lot of commercial work, I uh, think really great photographer. Um, but he contacted Mark and I, he was familiar with Mark. He didn't know me, but he was saying, you know, look, I'm in Cardiff. I know what you guys are doing. So if you'd like me to get involved or could I use the studio? We said, of course you can use the studio. Um, yeah, I would love to, you know, talk to you about your work. And for one thing or another, he got very busy um, and it didn't happen till the end of his stay with us. Uh, but sh long story short, he did exactly what you were just talking about. Um, and he was either on Instagram or he was on something locally, social media, and he saw this incredible, exciting face, this guy with a massive beard. And just when mm -hmm. I got to shoot him and just yeah. dropped him a message saying, Hi, I'm a professional, you know, he used the, I'm the Finland portrait professional of the year, blah, blah, blah. I'd love to photograph you. He shot him in his garage with a, with a cloth background, amazing black and white image. From that, Jack, it turned out that the guy worked for the BBC who worked on uh, Doctor Who, because it's obviously based in Cardiff. Doctor Who mm -hmm. were looking for people to put a book together of the behind the scenes and the technicians, and he got that job. Um, and then carried on doing behind the scenes work for uh, them, got another job for Daimler through it or Jaguar cars, um, and then ended up photographing. We've got a Cardiff Jack Sparrow, okay? So he's a, a lookalike. Yeah. Anti shot him, thought I, one of Anti's personal projects was doing film posters or recreating film posters. Shot this guy in his garage, ended up getting a contract to do all the Comic Cons in London, and then got the job to cover the Walking Dead premiere in New York. So it just how these things can spiral, isn't it? Just from personal projects. I think that's so important. We're going to talk about it more later because it's a thing that I that's really, superb. Yeah. What, what a what a stretch of gigs to get. To yeah, that's so amazing. over the span of a year, earned him really good money, got him traveling the world, yeah. and you know, and, and covering these things, just phenomenal. Um, so important, that, uh, really important when we were chatting about the personal projects and why when you said that you were going to talk about it, how it is so, so we talk about it all the time here. Brilliant. So this is the first two shot. I call it a two shot. You might have a different term for it. And it'd be interested that the story and, and how things change when there are two two subjects in the shoot. Yeah. Um, OK, so this is probably our most recent editorial. We shot this right at the end of last year for a few magazines. It's um, it's two boys um, and guys are particularly hard to shoot because they either want to do the, um, you know, the conventional catalogy kind of pose hand to mouth and looking in the distance, looking really pained and all that boring stuff. Um, so we I. Um, cast with a lot of different agencies and they're amazing because they kind of look like brothers one might look like you know female model um so the whole thing about this was you know it was just how they would come together on set and luckily brilliantly for us harry on the right was much more experienced and been working in japan um pierce on the left liverpool lad um just starting out but they really really worked and posing too is difficult um and what i always say when i'm posing two or more is you know right at the start of it is it's kind of giving them a, an olive branch to get in close is that i just say look the camera pulls you apart um and by that you know technically i, I wouldn't go into the technic 
element on the set but it's just because of the you know, whether it's you know you're shooting on a, even if a hundred mil um there's something in the relationship that pulls it apart so i've got them in close and it is all about you know intimacy um and that's one of the most beautiful things in photography as well that's what's connected to uh emotion which is you know at the heart of how and why we sell photography because we need to resonate and we need to connect either with our clients or if we're shooting for you know even whatever we're shooting whether it's for tony and guy or for baby portraits or for you know still life food it has to resonate so shooting these two boys you know it just i had to shoot quite a few frames um just so they loosened up and we shot them both individually i would never ever start with a double shot it's just too much um to get right in terms of whether one, one is blinking whether the models feel comfortable so we warmed both of them up and then individually and then got them in together and shot shot this very very quickly because it is close um and there's skin involved and they're two young lads so you know but um the magazine loved it um i showed it to quite a few agents and they love it and they they all sort of said you know we could see that on a massive board down on um you know oxford street outside top shop or something so you know and that's who we want to be targeting with stuff like this Brilliant. And so again, now with, this was a brief, wasn't it? You just said so. This was a job, and and did they determine that they wanted two people in it, or was that something you came it, up with in the concept? It, it was an editorial. So the makeup artist got commissioned by the magazine to shoot an editorial, and the budget was microscopic. But that's not why we do editorial. We do editorial yeah. to you know get great stuff in magazines and then get more work from it and shoot some personal ideas. So it was her brief and she was an incredibly good art director. Um, some, you know, I work, her name's Lan. Again, she's on my Instagram. She does the makeup for Tony and Guy. So she art directed the shoot and she came to us, me with the idea. But again, we talked a lot about the ideas and I suggest, I said, look, I really want this shot with two boys. And she was like, yeah, cool see who's about and so um you know i got these two down and interesting enough as, a, as an aside but very connected with where we're all at currently um i shot this on a sunday towards the end of last year and i was in isolation obviously i was in isolation for 14 days and i did a test on the monday and i didn't get the results back till saturday night um before the before the shoot and I, I was clear i was negative but point being is that luckily everybody held firm and just said look jack if you can do it we'll turn up if you can't do it we'll do it another day but it wouldn't have happened if and i'm so glad because the film we got from it is amazing and we got two different stories which i think is the next picture it's harry with a much darker makeup and so sometimes these things you just have to push really hard. No, nothing comes easy in photography. Um, that's what I think we've all got to remember is that, you know, I've been in the game for, I don't know, 16 or 17 years and shooting beauty for about maybe nine, eight or nine. And it's such hard work. I remember going to a, um, a consultant about six, seven years ago saying, look, I, I'd never shut off from it. I'm always sort of thinking about it or doing it. She's like, look, you're a photographer. You just need to eat, live, sleep, breathe it, or, you know, do something else. And it was just really, really good advice. Um, so yeah, this next shot is, it's Harry. We, we had the two boys for the whole day. So we wanted to make the most of it and do two different stories. And we got about nine pictures for each story. And, you know, the team was so quick. They did the hair and makeup probably in about 25 minutes. Um, and again, we're showing this to agencies and things and they lo they love the picture um we had a good team on that day oh it's strong mate really strong I remember when you sent those through it was like wow and even to be honest with the two boys um when i first glanced at it and it was a first glance you know when you sent the images over my first reaction before really looking at it is i thought there were two girls and then when i did stop and go oh hang on a minute it's a girl and a boy and then i went no it's not it's two boys. And you know what we did in the office? Is I asked everybody to have a look at it. So I didn't tell them. And I just yeah. went and straight away. And, you know, it was, and I went, 
And but on her, our designer, Hawkeye, our graphic designer, she went, Oh yeah, that's that they're two boys. Straight off the bat. And everybody else, well, everybody else, uh, oh, apart from Mark, he got it because he, he's cocky like that. But everybody else was like, <laughs> oh, oh, you're right. You know what, Jan, you are, you know what, Jay, it is two boys, isn't it? So actually, I don't know, but I'll be asking Jack, but you've answered that for me, to be honest. So there we go. <laughs> so, excellent. Excellent. Um, brilliant. Okay, brilliant. Well, that, I mean, they're the images, um, but already uh, 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 a triumph of knowledge from you. But what, what, I'm, what I discussed that I wanted to do with you, as you know, is and you wanted to share as well, um, you know, obviously, and you've already given us some great insights into it. Um, I think it's so important. I've got to reiterate it, but you've done it yourself anyway. Uh, and uh, Mark and I are always talking about it with, with our members in whatever genre. It's doing so much for yourself. It's great that you can do it for a living and you can earn money from it. But you've got, you know, you are obviously dead passionate about what you do. Um, and obviously, you know, I'm not on the levels of like Mark is, but always photograph photography in the, in your mind, in the goal. But the personal side of it, even if it's not in expensive studios and with the top paid models, mate, you've got to keep pushing yourself. You've got to keep learning. That's one of our messages, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, it is 100 percent of your living time. I mean, I've got we've got a two and a half year old boy. Um, and even when I'm out walking with him, I'm just thinking and looking all the time. And I've just, on a separate but linked note, I've just bought a little um, Superheads camera. I don't know if you know one of, what one of those is. Maybe we can put it up in a link afterwards. But it's just a little digital movie camera. Um, but it looks like Super 8. And just, just shooting that of plants and things just makes you feel reconnected with why we're here. You know, it's great. Well, we didn't talk about that. We said we were going to. So we haven't. We obviously were with the Photographer Academy. But you were obviously when I looked you up after we knew you were getting involved. You know, you are listed as a photographer slash filmmaker, and you were saying how obviously things were changing, and that's very much part of it. So give us a little insight into that then, and the filmmaking side of it, and how does that play into your work as well, Jack? Yeah, and um, plays a massive part of what we do and I think I was fortunate enough about three-ish years ago to really pick up the video side um, because I mean the first pretty much the first film we shot it was a fashion film um, one model full length black and white it's it's, it's a beautiful film um, which it's on my website it's called Oslo the client came over from Oslo um, and it finalized for the AOP um fashion awards which is a, just a great marketing tool getting into the finals of something like that but i always wanted to make films ever since i was a kid i wanted to make you know music videos so the, for the industry the photographic industry to be forced by whether it's the client or the way that we're consuming media as society it, it's so much is about moving image and we need to embrace it as as photographers and i actually think as photographers we bring a unique exciting element into it because we're so pictorial and and 2d we, we look at things very very differently now that count, counts against me on set because i'm so in my stills mode that i find it very difficult and i no longer really pick up the video camera on set i have you know, one of my team does and i direct the shoot depending on the shoot there might be you know a gaffer sparks you know that's a big shoot there might be 30 of us on there or we might do it really gorilla just with myself and my team but you know the video side has been really exciting and now we're getting commissioned for videos um for beauty campaigns you know, skin campaigns so i i just think i'd, I'd be fascinated to know out of how many people or on this session are doing video and whether it's out of choice and luckily for me it was out of choice but i feel really um fortunate that i took it on just in the nick of time because another important part of it jay is that i'm able to now have conversations with um inquiries and potential clients or current clients about the filming aspect you know be it how the videos are going to be used the deliverables the ratios, what camera we might need to shoot it on, um, you know, stuff that I didn't have a clue about. So it's been a real steep learning curve, but uh, it's, it's so important. 
well, you you didn't know this, and we've not touched on it. So my background is film and television. So as much as um, oh. Mark is my uncle and he taught me photography at sixteen. I went into film and television and that's what I wanted to do. I didn't get there back here when photography, which is, you know, another story, different story. But uh, it was funny when you were talking about um, the, your little, uh, your little super head camera. I, I had uh, a super eight camera when I was a student and um, I was obsessed as I still am with Anton Corbin as a photographer oh. uh, and filmmaker. And I was, I was a, I still am a huge Depeche Mode fan and I have a load yes. of his books. And then I saw an interview with him and he had, I can't remember what it was. I, it, I broke it, but he had this particular Super 8 camera, and I went out and managed to get one. Um, and my first film, university film project, was all shot on it, and I still have it. It's terrible, oh. um, but uh, you know, I, I did, and uh, so influenced by him and his processes in photography as mm. well as, as filmmaking. And then, of course, he gave us some you know wonderful films as well. Um, but it's quite interesting that you were saying how you know you loved it something that mark has taught our portrait photographers going back the last probably five or six years was as the video became uh, a feature now on on most if not all you know dslrs and uh, and so on is that we actually encouraged our photographers portrait photographers to incorporate video into their sessions um, and what we were doing is you know when you get off, even on a family basis when the kids are playing up a little bit or they're running around um, or playing is that uh, Mark's quite good at it. He's quick at it. And, you know, he would just grab a little bit of video while mum's touching up her hair or getting changed or whatever it is. Um, yeah. I remember one specific session, Jack, he, uh, the, the mum was off getting changed or something like that or seen to one of the other kids. And I think she was about four or five little girl. And he said, tell you what, what I want you to do, I want you to run up to the camera stop on that point and i wanted to go i love you mum oh. and, and she did and the mum knew nothing about it until the viewing and in that viewing we'd put this little video together and um yeah. you know and to be honest we sold it it wasn't done to sell it was done to sell um and we, we use it as an upsell jack to be honest we made this little video and we showed it in the viewing session and look if you buy that 40 inch wall art We'll throw in the video and we put up the video on the price tag, you know, under quid. It hasn't cost us that, but, you know, but we absolutely preach it. But uh, no, really interesting, especially when you sent, sent me some of your behind the scenes, as we're going to see now in a minute. Um, you know, I saw that, you know, the video guys behind you and stuff like that as well. So it was, it was in, interesting to me. And I think from a yeah. filmmaking background from 20 odd years ago, when, you know, video on, and film on, on DSLR didn't exist, so I think I've I've seen the industry change because it's much much more affordable and the ability for these great even young filmmakers to have the accessibility that I was lucky enough to have, but it cost me a fortune. You know, we were shooting sixteen millimeter film, and you know, wow, you know, so cool. yeah, old school. It was great, and I loved it. But yeah, come out with some debt. But you know, that's a webinar for another yeah. story. I think so. I've got some good stories <laughs> on that uh, on that one. Um, have have spent the night drinking with Ke um, Kiefer Sutherland. I was just leaving at that uh, a long time ago. And yes, he was a party right. boy. Party boy. I'm um, sure. Well, that was a good night. <laughs> it was okay. a good night. Yeah, it was a really good night. Um, good. The team, you've touched on it. And I really wanted to sort of talk about that. I know I chatted about my experiences on one of these kind of shoots. But I mean, just these images that you've shared with us. They show the scale of it. Obviously, I know this obviously prior lockdown because this isn't going to happen uh, in this environment. But this, <laughs> is this, a, this is an accurate reflection of, of, of a team, right, Jack, in one of these bigger shoots. Do you want to run us down? Who are these people? What are they doing? Yeah, I mean, so on I mean, the team, for example, on this shoot was much bigger. There's probably about 20, 25 of us. Um, just to reiterate, you know very pre-covid um so on the right of the picture is maddie um one of my main makeup artists maddie austin um my assistant in the white t-shirt lulu who has gone on to be a phenomenal portrait photographer and is with a great agency and doing really well um part of the client um is in the glasses black t-shirt and then to my right is one of the hairdressers. To, behind him is a hairdressing um, assistant, 
And then there's Errol, um, who's a you know, big art director, but also big hairstylist, Errol Douglas. Um, he's one of the sort of biggest hairstylists in the world, really. So he was you know, on that particular shoot. But there's, you know, there's every aspect of the shoot, be it makeup, hair, fashion, they all have assistants. And I know that could sound very pretentious, but the re one of the key reasons being is that the assistant can be getting another model ready, um, you know, offset, but the actual person who's doing the makeup, the fashion or the hair needs to be on set, watching the monitor, watching what the model's doing, because you know it just needs constant monitoring really that everything's in place for you know for the client so the team the, you know to be clear, the team is everything and there is no hierarchy on my set you know from the person who's making the tea to the client to the whoever's on reception whatever it is everybody gets treated the same everybody gets fed properly um and you know that there's there's just it's always a chilled arena brilliant Brilliant. I, and I, I I think this will also show now, this is what we were referring to, I had a, a, a shot and we discussed this earlier, that this is one of the studios that you could, this is your downstairs studio, is that right? You're, it is, yeah, it's the downstairs. So, um, oh, I can see now, actually, it isn't a cove, it's like, that is a, a drop background, isn't it? So... That is, the cove is behind it. Um, uh, I can see it now, now you've said it. <laughs> yeah, but the... The reason we used color armor on that one um, is we just we couldn't achieve that kind of darker gray um, on a cove. So you know, just as long as the, the color armor is far enough back, you can get away with it. But obviously, not that we ever would. But if you're shooting at f16, for example, you just you see texture in the color armor. So we discussed, I asked you this question beforehand, obviously about studio location. Obviously we chatted about the fact that you were in France on location, but predominantly your, your studio photographer, Jack, was that right? Yeah, predominantly. I want to be more um, outside and we, um, you know, we've been out to Iceland and done editorials there in Australia, but I, I, you have to be careful what you put on your website really in terms of maybe we just decided to show primarily studio stuff but yeah we shoot on location and actually i love it on location but obviously shooting location in the uk brings up a huge amount of um issues certainly in terms of weather and if everybody's booked and you've got you know four or five models booked and the weather's rubbish you're you know you're knackered so while I'm on the location side of things, I know we're going to talk about getting that in a minute, uh, but I had a couple of questions that I hung on to now, knowing that we were going to get into these sort of sections. Um, sure. Looking at the hair and beauty, so um, one of the questions I've got for you, it was this one actually came in right back at the beginning with that very first, you know, uh, awesome black and white still that you talked about. Um, are there typical camera settings for shooting hair and beauty, Jack? Are they, are they go to ones for you? Or does it, it does it change on the shot? Um, it does change, but I think you know we all need a bit of a go to because sometimes we, we're all human and we need a bit of a a safety zone, um, something that we know works. And generally, you know, I'll often start around you know f eight, and if I can open up, and you know, I'd love to be shooting at you know f4 or something um f4.5 but you know sometimes quite often that's too that's gonna be too soft certainly for hair um and sometimes we'll shoot at 11 where more more needs to be sharper for the retoucher or for the client or if it's being blown up big and i shoot all my stills on a phase back with the hasselblad body because for me that's the most that's the ultimate combination in things like skin tones um detail and i'm aware that uh, look, i don't want to go into brands too much but there's a, a fantastic obviously one of the biggest medium format brands but their body in their back is so sharp which is something that they market you know super detailed super sharp and i know i know beauty photographers who use that system and it's too sharp for me and beauty is actually about a you know a softness and elegance and a sophistication for me 
especially shooting digital when you're going really really sharp um you know with the lens uh the back the body it's it's too much for beauty something's got to give you know brilliant mate thank you uh, we'll we'll finish uh, remind me to tell you a story about phase one back in a minute you'll, you'll love it we'll do that <laughs> hey we've all had them go down trust me please <laughs> um oh actually that that reflects to my next my next slide uh we've just chatted about go to settings i'm just running through the oh the, well actually you just touched on the camera let's just stick with that i do have a slide for kit but uh we'll we'll talk about that in a different way when i get to it um so you've just talked about that's your camera and setup of choice or are you ever mixing it up jack are you ever renting kit in any way or is that your preferred format um i mean kit wise we rent all lighting um i mean i've got my own um kinos and things but so rarely can we shoot with kinos i try and shoot some of my personal work with kinos because it's a continuous light and i i love continuous light um but we rent all lighting, we rent lenses as well. Um, I've got a 50 to 110 for the Hasselblad body. Now, obviously, I'm sure I could hear multiple sharp intakes of breath. My God, he's using a zoom. Um, but at both ends, at 110 and 50 on that particular lens, it's stunning. It's like losing, uh, using a prime. Um, it really is. But so I have my own camera and body just because if I'm traveling, I just want to know the intricacies of the camera. When how many times have we all hired stuff or borrowed stuff? And, you know, it can even be the same camera that we're used to. And something always goes wrong, always. So, um, yeah, I've decided ages ago to always own my own camera kit. But lighting, we always hire in because we try and every single shoot is different. Um, and as you can see on this slide here, I mentioned it earlier, there's a Breeze 77. Um, and Breezy is just such a beautiful light for, um, for shooting beauty, but you can't always have the budget to shoot the Breezy kit. And obviously we're, we're also talking about, you know, camera kit and lighting that, you know, to buy obviously can be incredibly expensive. So, but we often talk about the fact that you are able to hire these things. So if you, you know, if you, you want to have a go, uh, and I'm not in this environment because of COVID, but we'll be out of it one day, you know, the, the, the likes of the flash center would do camera days where you could go in and you could have a play and they'd have a model and they'd have a light set for you. And those days, you know, if, if you get the opportunity to do them then do them. And there are so many uh, also organizations that arrange these shooting days with lighting and kit and models on locations as well as you know a, a way to you know think about investing in a different way into your skills and learning isn't it and putting 100 percent. and these days they're really important for again for networking but also broadening your knowledge and your skills and can i just stay on camera because i don't want to sort of all be like oh you know it's prohibitive with the size of camera and things I, we do sometimes shoot on the the sony the a7 um the a7 r3 is basically a stills camera but i also do some really guerrilla filming on it as well it's and that's now because there's a new one or two versions put out i think that's like 1500 quid yeah and it's beautiful and i've, I've been brought up on eos you know i've got a few eos's if, yeah. if we're on location and i just want to mix it up personally i love mixing it up but if it's a particular kind of shoot, I can't mix it up because, you know, of, of how the pictures are going to be used. The, the reason I mainly shoot medium format is there's, you know, for shooting uh, faces, there's there's nothing better um, in terms of, you know, well, it's medium format. And the way that that whole kit handles features is, is beautiful. Brilliant. Um, a question here, Jack. I think I don't, I'm not sure if it's typed correctly, um, but are the shoots carefully metered? Sorry, I, I couldn't. Are they carefully what? Sorry, Meet, metered, like meters. How are you metering ah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll always start with the key. Um, one of my assistants. Um, I have a first assistant, a second assistant, and sometimes a third assistant, depending on the size of the shoot. Gareth, my first, will be metering. Um, but before that, Gareth and I will have gone through how I want it lit. So, uh, you know, we worked together now for so many years. And again, it's surrounding yourself with great people. I mean, Ga 
you know, there are probably a few people on this um, session who know, you know, some of the world's greatest fashion photographers that they're, they're called uh, Merton Marcus. Gareth was with Merton Marcus for five years um, and he came on to me. So, yeah, I trust Gareth implicitly. He meters every single light, but beforehand he knows exactly what I want. So, I'll, you know, I don't want to be metering on, on the this actual shoot day. I want to be able to chat with the client or or watch the makeup going on the model to see which angle I want to shoot her. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm working constantly, but I don't want to be working with the light meter. Brilliant. Um, somebody, I, I think it was the same person who asked the initial question, but we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Um, she was specific, even though that's a great insight. She was specifically asking because it was obviously came in earlier. You know the shot you talked about, the go see shot with the the lady in your studio with the window light. Would you still be yeah. metering that type of shot, Jack? Or would you be doing that in camera? To no, to be honest, no, I did it in camera. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, as a advertising photographer, primarily, I I give anything to uh, be loose. And, you know, I can't be loose on shoots like the slide you, you've got. I, I have to achieve a certain amount of pictures for the client. Whereas the, you know, and I'm really glad that, um, you know, your member asked that question because, um, no, I just looked at, what was happening inside the camera, um, you know, where my F stop was and uh, because I wanted to concentrate on, on what, what, what she was looking like or, or, or how the light was hitting her. And yeah, there were frames that didn't come out. I didn't care. I didn't show her that them or, or anyone else. They, they don't need to be. So I think being gorilla is just lovely. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. It is, it's just about um, knowing when and how to mix it up. Brilliant. Um, Jack, um, what, I think I'm reading the question correctly. So we're looking at this shot now. I would, we, obviously this is a, uh, you know, a client and a, what kind of scale in, what's the cost of that shoe? I'm not about you. What do you think, what, give them, and I, they've asked the insight of what you think the cost of that, that shoe is to a, to a client. Oh, it's how long is a piece of string? Yeah. Um, because uh, how many models and obviously a big section of the fee is models um you know something like this would potentially start um 10 15 grand it's amazing isn't it it is it is um and this particular shoot was um for something to do with l'oreal so you know brands like l'oreal do have yeah, money yeah. to yeah. put into shoots and things but yeah, I think when you're talking models, studio, catering, team, assistance, lighting, you know, you're starting at 10, 15, really. Yeah, no, oh, brilliant. Well, look, let's move on to the models. Um, we touched on, um, so we've had a specific question. Do you have a particular flow of questions or dialogue when you're working with the models? Uh, you talked about, obviously, you're looking for the right person in advance. Um, but you know, what, what time do you invest in them? Does that make sense? If maybe, is there a case where you're getting them for the first time on the set and you've not spoken to them before? Do you know what? That happens most of the time. Um, I know, you know, maybe we like to think that there's time to chat with them, um, in the makeup room or, um, when they're having a cup of coffee and things, I'll always try and make time to chat with the model before they come on set, because I think, you know, and, and it's a good question. What, what do I say? I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not amazing with the dialogue. I, you know, I'm not one of those photographers that can crack the jokes and, um, get you know the patter right all the time so generally I just ask things like look you know have you had far to travel in today because then that opens up well actually I've traveled from um, you know wherever uh, Notting Hill or I've traveled down from Manchester oh yeah yeah uh, my girlfriend's from Manchester or um, oh we did a, a go see in Notting Hill whereabouts in Notting Hill so it's just asking questions that are open-ended and then that takes them out of any sort of fear of walking into a room full of 20 or 30 people that they've never met before um and up until you know fairly recently i had a dog that was a great sort of um communication starter um but it's and then yes yeah, so generally it is when they first arrive on set and i would often do the same i'll just put the camera by my side so it's not um intrusive 
um, and just say, yeah, did you get a coffee this morning? The coffee's great here, isn't it? Or, you know, where, again, where have you traveled from? How are you doing? Um, just any human sort of questions. And often, sometimes the, the models are Eastern European and their English isn't great. So I just very, I'm very quick because I have to be incredibly quick on set. Sometimes I just have a minute or two to shoot the model. I'm very quick to establish the conversation into another area, but not a particularly exciting area or a cool area or a funny area, but it's an area where I can um, obtain some common ground because you need to, that's part of my role. And even if it's down to anything um, silly, sometimes it, it, it's just, you have to have a, I can't just pick the camera up and go pose. Um, you need some human angle there. Brilliant. Thanks for that, mate. Um, I've made a note because you said to remind you, and I think it's relevant now we're talking about models, to, to, to remind you about the importance um, of Instagram. So it wanted to lead into not obviously yourself, obviously established, an established, you know, fashion and hair and beauty photographer now. Uh, but like you said, going, getting started for these guys, getting started, you know, you were saying about Instagram. Is that quite an acceptable platform for you to contact a protect? A potential model with Jack? Have you found that fairly straightforward these days? Extremely straightforward, extremely acceptable. Um, either the professional models or the non-professional models, they've all got accounts. And, you know, it's just about reaching out to, to them and just saying, look, um, I'm a local photographer. I'd love to take your picture. Um, here's my website, which is again, you know, um, hopefully there's been some things coming out of this talk, which is about, you know, I, I've seen it on your website and you're, you're right to, it's about making money. Um, so just say, look, you know, um, obviously this isn't involved in this conversation with the potential model, but here is my website. Now, you know, your website is your, one of your main marketing things. So I've come at this in two different ways. So yeah, reach out on Instagram or I think there are other webs, you know, model mayhem and things. I don't know, yeah. you know, model mayhem doesn't exist. I don't think anymore, but there's, there's equivalent just reaching out and writing something really short and polite and, um, you know, you're around to catch up on the phone or something. I think you're know, having a phone call humanizes it as well, because unfortunately in this day and age, you know, um, the person who's been approached, you know, does have to, and rightly is sometimes, you know, wanting to check you out a little bit more. I might bring a friend and I'm absolutely fine with people bringing friends. It's cool. Yeah. You know, it, um, it's, you know, actually it makes everything a lot easier. Yeah. We, we dealt with it loads, you know, when, when we're doing the commercial stuff or the sponsored filming and we need models and, and things like that. Um, we found, um, we use star now rather than, um, model mayhem, uh, even though it's more actor based and dancer based platform, we've actually found them to be some of the best models we've ever had um and you know often we would just put out you know you you called it the go see you know we'd go we'd do like a test shoot looking for new models for a series of training videos you know just do a shout of a test shoot you know time for images nothing else at that stage um and uh, and start exactly what you just said start that conversation but you're absolutely right about the website it's giving you not that it's not that kudos it's that the model's peace of mind that you are who you say you are and you know you are what it is and even um in the cost of of creating a website today can be next to nothing um that uh, having that awareness or even if it is you know your social media but making sure that the reviews and the comments are there if you are using those before you start but uh, you just touched on a really important thing get them off a message as quick as possible and humanize it with a phone call make it personal and and we have always said as you've just said um that um when we're shooting with a with a new model for the first time um we either have uh which we do have a female assistant or on our graphic designer would be there or mark's debbie mm -hmm. mark's wife in the past um before me and working with mark mark had a full-time assistant who was female so we always made sure they were there to give that model's peace of mind. But if they turn around, as you said, and can I bring someone with me? Absolutely, of course you can. Um, that right. protects them, it protects you, and obviously just shows uh, who you are as a person. So I think that was really, really important. It was it? I, I never, you know, Instagram, yeah, of course, I never really thought about it actually until you brought it up, Jack, because we haven't used it 
in that way. But of course, it's such a huge thing now that it makes total sense. And I know I get messages left, right and centre from the Academy on Instagram and on the Facebook pages and everything like that. And so many people do that before they even pick up an email or a phone call anymore. Um, and it was just like, well, yeah, it makes total sense. It makes total sense to me. Um, yeah, and I think it touches on what we talked about at the early point of the conversation. Sometimes we just have, even if we don't want to, we have to bend to what is happening um, because we, you know, I, I see it in, you know, sometimes with older photographers, and I'm no spring chicken, I'm 46, um, you know, just say, you know, give, give things like Instagram a hard time, and, you know, oh, I'm not having an Instagram account, social um, media rubbish. It's just like, hold on a minute, you, you don't make the rules. Um, you know, th this is how people are. They are genuinely doing their research on, um, you know, if clients are researching your Instagram, there's no two ways about it. Yeah, yeah. Instagram and website um to see if you know if you're the right kind of photographer or if um you know it's it's just the way it is so what do we do we, we respond we have to get things looking good absolutely absolutely we're pretty you know, the amount of times that to the to our mentoring and we're portrait photographer mentoring as you know but you know it's like guys you've got to you know put the time and effort into your instagram and your, your photographers for god's sake Oh yeah, but you yeah. know it's not my it's not my demographic, but the client is, and that's who's looking yeah. at you, you know. And so you know, I, I have to sometimes, you know, really, you know, get it down their throats. They get it and they understand it once, obviously. But it's just you know that that valuable time. Right. But they have the time at the moment, Jack, and that's where I've been kicking their backsides on it. So they're, yeah. they're, they're getting there, but no, absolutely. Well, on that, Jay, and talking about demographic, I thought it was really nice earlier. I think um, the question came about. How I shot the girl upstairs in the studio that came from a female member of yours and can I just say that I think um because I could be completely wrong but I'm assuming um you know the academy is mostly male because the industry is very much mostly male um and the photographic world is mostly male I think it's and some of my best friends are female photographers and I think you know whoever asked the question there you know because the way the world is, you're, you're already leaps and bounds ahead of us, uh, of, the, of the men, certainly in, in terms of portrait photographer or beauty photography or fashion photography. And, you know, women, you know, who can shoot, they're rightly doing extremely well. And I think I think that's great. So I just wanted to put that out there that no. the female photographer in, you know, that damn right. Good stuff. I agree. And actually, what's nice from a different perspective, obviously, is you as we were chatting before and those of you who've been with us for a long time. I mean, the Academy's 13 years old, but we have absolutely seen that shift in those 13 years where we are seeing more and more female photographers. And it's great, you know, and when we're looking right. at, right. We, we do a, a, a monthly Academy Life photo critique. It's completely anonymous. It's just designed to help people. But, you know, actually I'm seeing a bit of 50-50 split there most times, Jack, which is fantastic, you know. Um, and Good. in the portrait studios that we have, um, I would say it's probably two thirds male, but the the women, as you just said, some of them, the photographers, they are the, some of the strongest photographers we have, absolutely. And we have one incredibly phenomenal, yeah, and she's female, phenomenal boudoir business, but it is phenomenal. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm in awe of her. But, I mean, she does what we tell her to do and we help her, but her, be her image is beautiful, but she's just got, you know, a perfect team around her and of course, women to it we've had a successful and um, we still shoot a successful boudoir business but we've done it we've sold it on us and we've got you know the female assistants but definitely um the photographer that i'm referring to yeah just rocking and rolling and just a completely started out when we met her as boudoir mm -hmm. and babies quite an opposite thing as a studio but now 100 sure. percent uh beauty and boudoir and going into uh Christmas, um, 90 sessions booked between January and March. She's had to move them all because of the lockdown, mm -hmm. but already has 70 of them rebooked. So it's just proof that even in lockdown, I know it's not commercial, but even in lockdown and with going on, um, you know, and you are dedicated, like you've been talking about today as a photographer and you want it, it it's doable. And, you know, they want her to shoot them and they will wait for her. her. So that's absolutely great. brilliant. 
Um, I wanted Brilliant. to just quickly jump back, and we've run over a bit, but and everybody's staying with us, Jack. So as long as you're okay for time, but we're we're almost there. I wanted well, I've, I, we talked about the kit briefly. I wanted to bring it back. Um, because I didn't put it in, but you, you mentioned it, and then it's been a question about uh, retouch, and I forgot how important that is, and I hadn't thought about it. So you mentioned that you use retouches. You're not. Do, you, oh, are you doing some of it yourself, or are you using retouches fully, Jack? So I used to do all my retouch until about five years ago, and then my time is better spent doing other things in the business. And there are retouchers who are a million times better than me. So I've carved and built relationships. Um, all commercial pictures have a certain element of retouch, apart from, um, and this is the caveat, certain brands that we've shot for. Um, we did some stuff for Boots, and there was no retouch because this particular brand that Boots were doing it with, and Boots don't, I think, retouch. Certainly in Boots, the Boots magazine, now they've got Health and Beauty magazine, there is no retouch. So it depends on the client and the shoot. All of the pics, the six pictures were retouched, but two of them weren't. The one in Arles and the one upstairs in my office have had no retouch. Um, and that's partly because, you know, there's a, they're not lit with flash. So there's instantly a softness there that, um, you know, flash, you do, then, you know, things are just, there's more detail picked out. So you need to retouch, but retouching is a massive part of what we do, but I oversee all retouch now and I will give the retoucher a brief and I will to the 11th mile encourage the client to do as little retouch as humanly possible, because I just think it's, a, it's our role and our job to get everything in camera. And I don't want to be changing you know, colors or taking imperfections out because actually the imperfections are what beauty is. Fundamentally, beauty is about imperfections and it's not about perfection. And if we're trying to get perfection, that's, um, you're, you're, you're on a lost path. Yeah, we can strive towards excellence and excellence certainly in the commercial world is, is, is great and it's a great achievement, but actually it's um, about the imperfections but maybe that's a conversation for another time. But yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant, mate. Thank you. Well, there's one question. There's only one, well, there's two questions left for you. Uh, one is on the re, the retouch note and why I brought it up. Um, so you've just answered how much you do and when you're using them. Um, if looking to use a retoucher, where's a good place to start to look for one and how best you build on a relationship with it? Whew. I mean, outsourcing retouching is incredibly scary because invariably it's subjective and people, the main thing that goes wrong with retouch is, is skin. The very few people can get skin right. Um, I mean, look, there are retouch houses. I'm very happy to have um, email contact with anybody in your, or via you um, about, sure. you know, I can mention names, um, but it's about, it's about looking at their work, their website, and seeing if they handle skin the way that you want it handled. You know, because I think certainly, again, in portraiture, it's about um, the level of retouch. And I just want, personally, I want less and less. Finding a retoucher is, is really hard. Um, I would just put in retouch house, and invariably, there'll be probably the main ones in London, like Post coming up or... Um, tonic and notion and things blah blah um but it's just finding someone who do you know what i so there's a magazine called um l'officiel um it's l apostrophe o f f i c i e l now l'officiel a bit like vogue they have um magazines in all most different countries um and i remember briefing a new retoucher I was working with about five years ago saying, look, you know Le Fichiel. Have a look at how they handle skin tones and hair and things. Because I want a little bit of zip because the client wants zip invariably. But I do not want you to um, make my pictures look like a mannequin. So that things like that is, is, is good. So maybe the people who are shooting beauty you know, go away or they've probably got issues of Le Fichiel. But Le Fichiel's 
generally lovely because it retouch needs to have a little bit of elevation in it by elevation i mean making your pictures just look a bit more uh, just a little bit more pumped by pumped i don't necessarily mean pumped with contrast or saturation or anything like that it's just a gloss that a good retoucher can bring to it yeah, it was Does interesting. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Um, going back to magazines before I forget, and I'm, I made loads of notes here. You can see my scribbles in case I forget to ask them. But it was interesting that you said that obviously your image uh, featured in Hunger. Um, I, we've got hundreds of issues of Hunger. Yeah, what an incredible magazine and inspiration. Um, sure. You know, for that, so definitely worth uh, checking out. And, and Mark and I. Um, during, I, I don't didn't have access to it, but Mark did. You know, uh, I don't know what it is, but Rankin's television program on Sky Arts or whatever it was that was great during the uh, the lockdown. Where he, I don't know if you saw that. I can't remember what it's called though. Um, but it was on Sky Arts, and I think it's repeated on Sky Arts. And he was having guest. Uh, he was putting a book together for, during lockdown, of people's images, and there was categories every month, and it was it was phenomenal. And he was giving him great. Uh, tips on shooting you know just you just shooting your families and things like that but with that fashion edge yeah. that you approached it with so uh, I, cool. I can't remember what it's called but if you go on sky arts and if you've got like catch up and you put in um you put in ranking you'll find it i think it might have been called ranking's world i could be wrong but it was uh and he was doing a book of their images these people's you know viewers images that he was doing for charity lockdown charities so but a great program if uh, if you haven't found it i'll try and remember what it is and put a link on the facebook uh, jack lastly um because you mentioned the obviously going back to the instagram thing and looking for the models you said that you found alice on instagram somebody just asked did you know what to look for for her as an example do you how you know so is it that are you usually searching on their full names you'd have to do a bit of homework how do you, how do you find these people because you went looking for her somebody told you right yeah so on Instagram, I'll see a shoot where I like the model. I might not even like the shoot, and that's fine. So I follow various magazines. I follow various makeup artists, hairstylists, studios, retouch houses, all kinds of people in my industry. Yeah. And then they post a picture, and then generally the model is tagged. So yeah. I'll then click on the model and um, follow her and then private message her. Um, or put a message on uh, a photo of, uh, that she's just posted online so that she'll you know, clearly um, get my message. Yep. So that's, so I find the name in other people's posts, if that makes sense. Absolutely, mate, that's brilliant. Uh, Jack, thank you so much. There's already loads of praise coming in the chat panel for your insight, and it has been an incredible insight. And it was, to be honest, it was wow. years ago since we were chatting that I'd been, um, you know, with, with my friend Andy, um, you know, in the environment, obviously that you work in, and yeah, you know, actually just seeing your behind the scenes images just brought so much back. Because over the last couple of years, you know, it's just been me and Mark or, or the guys here uh, on on the team. So uh, it's absolutely. Oh, uh, he seems to be using medium format. Do you do that exclusively? I think you touched on obviously the new Sony, but as a whole, for the fashion and hair and beauty, it's technically normally medium format, right? It is, yeah, um, which is, you know, for the reason of needing the file size, but primarily it's just what medium format does, um, you know, the combination of the lens, the body, the back, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it feels so different to a you know, DSLR. I remember that I had a fake story. I will share it with you because there are quite a few people I can see on the chat panel know and will know who I'm talking about. So one of the guys who shoots real, well, not now because of COVID, but one of our masters on the academy is a chap from Scotland called Kenny Martin. And going back to the years of the photography show before it was, uh, when it was focused on imaging, God, that's going back a bit, isn't it? You know, the academy would have a huge stand. <laughs> uh, the academy would have a huge stand there and our, teach, our photography masters would come and do demonstrations and Kenny would always be on set with us and Kenny was a phase phase uh, phase one uh, user he'd gone from Hasselblad to phase one um, and a great portrait photographer and uh, I remember Kenny coming over one morning before the show had opened Mark and I were on the stand just setting up but we were always quite good that we allowed the team to come in a bit later and Mark and I would go in early to get you know the, the lights on and let them have a lie in for a busy day and Kenny come over with this, um, with this, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not techie, so you'll know better than me, but he came over with a phase one back. 
He said, this mm-hmm. is brand new, Jay. It's This is the uh, only one at the show. It's It only shoots black and white. Um, it, however many million pixels, Jack, I, I'm not techie as you'll, as you'll gather. But, you know, he just couldn't. He was grinning like a child in a sweet shop, he was. And he was going, yeah. it's worth thousands. and th- We're talking tens of thousands of pounds, mate, right? Um, and I went, oh, that's nice. So what's he going to do? They said, well, Jay, I want to take your picture. And I went, what do you want to take my picture for? And he said, well, I, I, I you know, um, long story short, we'd been in the bar the previous night and I don't drink. And I told him the story of why I don't drink because I used to drink, as we told you by Keith Sutherland, but I don't drink. And I referred yeah. to alcohol as the dark side. And obviously I'm a massive Star Wars geek as well. But we were having this conversation about, you know, giving it up and was it hard and this, that and the other. And yeah. So he remembered the story and he said, oh, I want to take this image of you. I've got this, you know, I want to put half your face in black shade. And now I've got the chance to use this camera. And, I, you know, so I said, yeah, whatever, because I don't like having my picture taken. But I said, you can do it. Of course you can do it. But he put the back down in front of Mark, which was the foolish thing to do. So he put <laughs> thousands of pounds, one of a kind thing, while he oh. sets up his lights and he puts me in place. And I can see Mark and he literally just puts it in the cupboard and locks it up. But then Mark walks <laughs> off, right? just leaves the, leaves the stand. Well, this grown man, grandfather, I should say, I've never seen somebody sweat so quickly in their life. And we, did leave it going. we did leave it going for about 10 minutes. Um, and he, and the, the funny thing that made me laugh, Jack, is when he took the picture, is that he puts the back on the camera, he stops sweating, he's got his lighting right in his frame, and he's going, right, Jay, we're ready. Are you ready? He said, yeah, because he wanted me to be a, do a grimace. I can't do smiles, and uh, he took the picture. But he had to put a red filter, hold a red filter in front of the lens. And I said, "What are you doing that for?" He said, "To make it blacker." And I went, "That's what I've got to do." And I went, thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds, whatever it was for this back, and you still have to hold a red filter in front of the lens. It was just, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. just thought it was hilarious. Anyway, um, he sent me this picture. Uh, if anybody wants to go and have a look, if you search JP's photography on Facebook, I don't post anything on there. But the picture is on there uh, as my profile picture. And, you know, do you know what? I looked at it and I went, oh, yeah, it's a nice picture, mate, nice one. And then he sent me um, a 60-inch print. And when I looked at the detail on it, and I was long-haired at the time as I am now because of lockdown, Yeah. the detail in the hair and in the face was phenomenal. And it is, you know, black and it's pure black and pure white. It was just – so I got it. Um, but the file size was obscene, Jack, as you just mentioned. So it was just like, um, I get it and I understand it, especially in that environment. But it was just, yeah, but if you've seen, I wish we had video of, of Kenny sweating, you know, because he didn't have any hair, but he was bald at the end of that 10 minutes without any. <laughs> absolutely phenomenal on that. Jack, seriously, mate, thank you so much for your insight into what you do. Um, I will absolutely be holding you to get you back at some point because I'm sure there's plenty more we can share with them and by the sounds of it, lots more. And, well, I know there's lots more incredible imagery because I was looking at your Instagram yesterday. So um, so I will definitely take you up on that. And uh, yeah, um, really, real pleasure. I've really enjoyed it as of the people online with us, mate. So really, oh, great. Really and thank great. you for having me. Um, oh. you know, thank you. Uh, well, me on board. We yeah, thank, that. thank she is. On, she was online with us, but thank you for Laura for sorting it out. Um, and yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you. And I hope that it doesn't end here uh, on that. I'd be love to, love to have you yeah, back. Likewise. Thank you, mate. Okay. Have a great back. day, brother. Yeah, you stay safe. Thanks, guys. Guys, just before we do go, and a few of you are logging off, a few reminders don't forget about the magazine if you haven't checked it out. And as I said, October issue is Jack's issue, which you can download, and he's the featured photographer in there. Um, get involved with us on Instagram, Academy Offer if you want it. All of these things can be found on the Facebook page. You will get links to them all in a follow-up email from us tomorrow. And the rest of the week is planned out. Jack's with us, as you can see today. So today at five, shooting live from the studio on the YouTube channel, Mark will be shooting. Um, I'm just going to call it the red dress. I can promise you it'll be phenomenal. So join us live at five on the Academy YouTube channel. So just search the Photography Academy on YouTube. And then on Friday, I'm going to be joined by Panikos Hadjastili. He's the current, um, uh, what the word is, of the MPA, but also the MPA Photographer of the Year. 
and he's going to be with us on Friday telling us his portrait workflow and taking us through it. And I haven't got a slide there for it, but if you're following our landscape series, my landscape master photographer, Nigel Foster, is back tomorrow at 11 o'clock in the morning, and we're looking at night photography. He's going to, have to give us an insight on that. Jack, if you're still with me, thank you, mate. Love that. We'll talk again real oh, soon. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah, nice. cool. You all stay safe. Bye -bye. Take care.